Biobalance HealthCast, episode 149, Hormone Replacement FAQ, part two. Biobalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of Biobalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Last week in the podcast that we were doing, uh, we were talking about frequently asked questions that people who come to you for services uh, ask. And you made the distinction that there are different sets of questions. Mm -hmm. One, when people come in and say, I'm curious about this, I, I have symptoms that my regular physician is not uh, doesn't know what to do with and, mm -hmm. and so can, do I need this? Mm -hmm. And then another one that is a set of questions when people get pellets over time come in and ask. Mm -hmm. And the most commonly asked questions are posted on your website. Mm -hmm. But we were going to go through those questions right. and develop The ones answers. for the pa patients who have not come in to see me yet. And actually, I, I look at their lab. They don't have to invest any money mm -hmm. in seeing me until we, we give them information and the lab sheet, and then I look at their labs. Mm -hmm. And if they need this, right. then we make an appointment for them. If they don't, then we call them and tell them that, sometimes I tell them, I'll still see them and tell them what they need, mm -hmm. but just so that they have a referral for whatever they need. Okay. Well, and sometimes I just say, you know, you need to see your, your uh, either your gynecologist, your primary care, your urologist, right. or someone, and here's your lab so you can take it with you. Yeah. So we don't even establish them as patients unless we know that we can help them. And typically, even though your, your office doesn't do the insurance thing, the mm -hmm. third-party payer thing, their lab tests are covered by their insurance. They're, they are. So, they are. In general, if they have insurance, their lab tests yeah, are covered so there's by not a that. Lot of, uh, there's not out-of-pocket cost for them to find out if... Right. This is a thing that right, be which developed. is awesome. I yeah. mean, if it's something that could help, yeah. if their symptoms are related to that, right. So um, many people have two things. Like some people have autoimmune disorders, like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, something like that. But they also they have symptoms from that. But they also have symptoms because they don't have any hormones. Mm -hmm. And when they get the hormones, the symptoms of the rheumatoid arthritis usually get better, and the symptoms that are just independent of that get better as well. So so sometimes I have to figure out which it is by looking at history. Well, and I know one of the things that you figure out that you help people with that really isn't about inserting hormones is mm -hmm. thyroid deficiencies. Mm -hmm. if, if your thyroid's messed up, none of this other stuff's going to work anyway. Right. So you know? oftentimes I find that thyroid is is looked at like an illness that if it's on the sheet of lab and it's in the normal range, then you don't have it. Right. But I'm old enough to know that Way back when, we used to ask people questions. We right. used to say, do you feel cold all the time? Is your hair falling out? Do you, are your eyebrows falling out? And we'd look at that. Like is the your, last half of it. Yeah, the outside half. Yeah. Are your, is your tongue swollen? Do you have a slow colon? Like, do you, you know, have to take something to have, have a bowel movement? Do you, you know, constipation? Do you have to um, always wear a sweater when everybody else is warm? Kind of like being reptilian. Yeah. I mean, do you feel shut down? Do you have mm -hmm. a big goiter on your neck? I mean, some of these things I can see. Mm -hmm. But if your lab's normal and you have these symptoms, you need thyroid. I mean, I don't care if the lab, the lab could be wrong. And the lab often is wrong because we, we check basal temperatures. This is an old way of doing this, but it works. Mm -hmm. Instead of looking at the lab test, which just measures a, a hormonal level, we're looking at your body by checking the temperature of your body. So, so when you went to med school, yeah. were you trained, co consciously and deliberately trained, to do diagnostic evaluations of people when you saw them? Like you, you walk into a room, sit down, and you think, heart attack, diabetes, thyroid. <laughs> do you, no, do you but see that's, those things? that's a side effect of doing this for, for, for so almost years. 30 years. You just learn it. You just know when someone, you're, you're taught to look at the person in front of you yeah. and assess them, how they walk, how they talk, how th what their voice sounds like, what their... Mm -hmm. what their complexion is, how their hair distribution is, do they have hair growing up their arm, <laughs> females with hair growing up their arm, I mean, you know, or um, like I can look at people, they have they have dark skin like in, in the folds of their See, I, I think if any of neck, us who spend time doing that learn those things. Right. I mean, I mean I, it's you can learn that and you can see, but are you going to go talk to somebody you don't know who doesn't want your information and say, oh, hey, um, I think you got a goiter, I think you should see your doctor? 
you know, you, you got to be tempted, especially when you know it's life threatening. You look at somebody that's a walking heart attack. Now that don't you I do. Don't want to grab their. Uh huh. I do. Jowls but, and say, "Hey, buddy." Well, I had a, we had a good friend yeah. who came. We see once a year, and he's very active, and he was always running and biking and all this stuff, and he he wasn't even. He hadn't even really gained a lot of weight. He was completely gray. We were yeah. around the pool, yeah. and he and his wife were there. And I said, you need to send him to a cardiologist. And I told my husband to talk to him because I didn't want to just walk up to him because that's scary. Yeah. doctor walks up to you and says, you need to go see a heart card. Attack. Yeah, because <laughs> he looked like a walking yeah. heart attack. He yeah. had a heart attack three, three months later, and he hadn't gone to see anybody. Yeah. But at least I told him. I, was, I had at least warned him yeah. that... That look is the look of someone who's taking all the blood flow from the outside of their body and they're concentrating it on the inside so that they can just keep going. Mm -hmm. And just that pale gray look. And wow. it, we were out in the bright sun. Yeah. So, yeah, I do tell people I know. I mean, I tell my right. godchildren sure. and their mother and, you know, people who are friends, I'll tell them. They don't always want to hear it from me either, and I don't blame them. I mean, it's invasive to have somebody always looking at you. Well, and I have the same issue in in what I do, mm -hmm. because I'm trained. You, you look at the physical symptomology mm -hmm. and uh, attributes of that. You can watch look, why somebody's sitting. I look like at the emotional the stuff body. That, that's leaked out and 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 radiates out of people. When, when my wife and I first started uh, dating, we'd go out and and I would say, see that couple over there, they're having a fight, and she'd be like, what, well, <laughs> you know, at a restaurant or something. And over the years, she's learned enough now that, that she'll say, like, you want me to drop one of your cards on their table as I go by? <laughs> That's true. That's yeah. true. My husband's oh, yeah. learned it all, too. He kind of goes, "What?" He, if he sees somebody who's behind me, right. he says, now I want you to turn around or go to the bathroom. I want you to take a look. Do you think, you know, yeah. do you think that, is that a goiter? Or do, why does she have, like, no hair up here? Mm -hmm. You know, and that's a lack of estrogen. So, I mean... Or yeah. he, now he knows that. Right. Now he's like, oh, she needs some estrogen back there. <laughs> I mean, it's not critical. I mean, I'm, we're not making fun of people. We're just no. looking at we're things. We're talking about the diagnostic process that's beyond what you get on a lab sheet. And I can't, I can't live life without doing that now. Yeah. Now I've, I've done it so long, right. and I could tell so many things about people. But not every doctor does that. Mm -hmm. Not every doctor has that knack of observation. I mean, mm -hmm. you can't make every doctor the same. Right. So doctors have different areas. Right. And, and this is usually a skill of primary care. Mm -hmm. You know, so, and mm -hmm. OB's, OB-GYN yes. was primary to see care. Specialty, not they, the see, they see exactly, they're supposed yeah. to be focused. Yeah. And we're supposed to be all encompassing. So that is something that there's an opportunity to assess mm -hmm. if they've done all the preliminary mm -hmm. stuff and gotten their labs and, and aren't immediately disqualified by some other concern. Mm -hmm. So then you say, well, come on in and we'll talk about it. And mm -hmm. so then they come in mm -hmm. and they have questions they want to know. And so uh, mm -hmm. one of the questions that they ask is, okay, if I do this, how often do I need to do mm -hmm. this? So the answer to that is ideally the average woman does it every four months, comes in every four months for redosing because that's how long the testosterone and the estrogen pellets that we have last. Mm -hmm. Actually, they last longer than that, but we don't want you to go up and down to baseline, up and down to baseline. We want every patient to go up, stay up, and start to drop, and then replace it. Mm -hmm. So that as one set of pellets is coming down, the other set of pellets is going up. Mm -hmm. So we don't want you to all ever come back down to we how bad you are swings. now. We want little fluctuations, yeah, like a it's, sine wave. It's not, it's not good to have your hormones go up and down all the time. That's yeah. part of why we don't want you to cycle with progesterone. Uh -huh. Because that's what we did when we had PMS and, and uh, when we were younger. The only reason we have that is so we can have babies. When we're done having babies, we don't need that up and down. In fact, mm -hmm. that's what makes us kind of goofy when we're in the second half of our cycle and cycling. So we have no need to be goofy anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was all for, the, all for the purpose of having children. Yeah, in service of a goal. Yes. And now that's so now we want to be yeah. even, and so that's what the that's what the pellets do. If you don't let them drop all the way down, so it's every four months usually for women. There are some women who are marathoners, some women that are these little tiny people who I call hummingbirds. They're always moving. They don't ever stop. That's a great they sleep really short periods of time, or when they or they sleep a little here, a little here, a little here, like they nap, mm -hmm. and but they're always like. Their whole body's moving. Well, sometimes I, I have to up the dose or I have to have them come every three months because they just can't sustain a blood level that long because they're using it all the time. Mm -hmm. so, and in, uh, instead of giving them too much, 
I want to keep it a little bit lower. So they would have to come every three months. Now, I have 70-year-olds, 80-year-olds that we do it every six months mm -hmm. because in general, even with hormones, our metabolism slows down. We don't move around so much. Right. We don't have to right. unless we're working. I mean, in general, retirement means retirement. You right. get to have some fun, except for you. I won't let you do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so basically, it's every four months average, four three months. For women, three months if you're a marathoner or high high energy, and six months if you're older than 70. Okay. Now, for men, it's generally every six months, and that's how I was trained. Mm -hmm. However, I'm finding some men don't tolerate the high dose at the beginning mm -hmm. that comes with giving you the dose for six months. So some men, I'm, I'm giving a lower dose three times a year, which is every four months. You say they don't tolerate it. You mean they have side effects or? Well, they feel like they have too much or they feel they're sweating and they're, you know, all the signs of just like teenage, teen, teenage boys, too much sex drive, too much. You know, so they feel like they have too much when I give them enough to last the six months. I'm sorry, I'm laughing. My 18 year old son got a job doing construction this summer and like the second day at work, one, one of the coworkers looked around and said, I smell fresh onions. And it was because he was sweating so much. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, people who are 50 don't want to do that anymore. Exactly. Or 60 yeah, no, don't want to do that wanna, anymore. And if you I can control be a field it. Of fresh onions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. So I never really thought about sweating what you ate, but that's true. I don't know. That, that's I know just, that people who don't eat meat sweat a different type of really? scent. Than people who do, but we're supposed to be carnivores. So. You are what you eat. Yeah. We are what we eat. Yeah, that's true. So, so for men, it's every four or every six. Some men can go longer than that, especially if they're older. Yeah. So, that's. So then the second question that gets asked, uh, and and again because you began your work primarily with women and have evolved into treating mm -hmm. men, a lot of these questions are questions that women have. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this, the question one is about periods, and, and mm -hmm. will my periods be restored to the same if if, mm -hmm. uh, if I'm I hope just not. sweating? <laughs> well, exactly, and I think so they do too. After typically. menopause, after yeah. menopause, I mean, there was a belief. Some I think Suzanne Summers had in her book that everyone should have a period, but Suzanne Summers doesn't have a uterus, so I'm not going to take her. She also doesn't have a medical degree, and she doesn't have a medical degree. Well, and honestly. I don't understand the I don't understand the physiology behind it because that's the only thing periods are for for making babies. So, so that's fertility. Mm -hmm. So, ba basically, what we try to do is give just enough estrogen, to and which is balanced by progesterone if you have a uterus, so that you don't bleed. And this is after menopause. Okay, mm -hmm. so we don't want you to have any bleeding. We look at an ultrasound before to make sure there's nothing in there that's going to just bleed the minute we give you estrogen. And if there is, we tell you about it and then see if, see if it happens. If it does, you're aware of it and then send you to your gynecologist for treatment. Right. But basically, we don't want you to bleed. And by balancing both hormones, nothing c collects in the uterus. You're not making your own estrogen anymore after menopause. Now, before menopause, sometimes when we give testosterone, it's right at that time where the ovaries are not going to function very much anymore. Mm -hmm. So basically, that's at the time when you would go through menopause anyway. So oftentimes, I put people on testosterone, and then all of a sudden, they need estrogen too. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, it does bring on menopause just a few months early so that people stop bleeding. And so then we have to change our plan a little bit. Well, what about progesterone then? Progesterone, then we add progesterone. We always add progesterone if you have a, if a woman has a uterus. Okay. And that's only to protect her uterus, not for anything else. There's a small number of people that need progesterone to help them sleep and or help with irritability if they take any estrogen. So even if they have had a hysterectomy, that those very small percentage I will give progesterone to, and only the natural progesterone and only at night before they go to bed. Mm -hmm. Because it can make you tired. Mm -hmm. So, so if, if if you don't have it, it if you don't, it if you take it during the day, yeah, progesterone can make you tired. So I always give okay. it at night. All right, and that kind of, by the time you hit daytime, there's no hangover or anything, and it's protecting your uterus, but it's not at the highest dose level, so it doesn't make you tired. Okay, and a question that I would have, and I see it on your on your uh, website too, uh, looking at how do I make this decision? 
is, is you, I come in and I have symptoms that are concerning me, and I talk to you about those symptoms, and you give me the information. The next thing I want to know is what about side effects? Well, you know, mm -hmm. what, what other risks do I need to consider if, if I'm going to try to uh, say that I don't, I don't have as much fatigue as I once did, or I'm concerned about osteoporosis and muscle mm -hmm. mass and bone density? Uh, this might be something I want to do. But what about these other things? And, and people have heard horror stories or what yeah. have you. So, so what about side effects? Okay, so, so there's side effects that are specifically from the insertion process because we have to make a little cut, a two millimeter um, scalpel, sterile scalpel opening in the skin to put the pellets into the fat, okay? Mm -hmm. so, so there can be bleeding, which is rare. I mean, really rare. There can be bruising. We can, and there can be infection, although we use sterile techniques, so we rarely get infections. Mm -hmm. And we don't know who's, who's so uh, immune suppressed just from their exhaustion or, or from their other illnesses that, that might just get an infection no matter what happens if you make any well, cut just, in their it's skin. it's surgery. I mean, you, you yeah, cut them surgery. open and you put something in their body. It's a tiny little cut. It's like yeah, a, it's it's like like a big shot. The, yeah, it's like a big shot. It's like a big shot. Yeah. So, so those, are, those are the big risks of the procedure itself. Mm -hmm. The other risk of the pellet is some people have, have a sensitivity to the pellet, and so when we put it into the fat, it's about that far down into the fat at a 45 degree angle. So we need some fat, but we put it into the fat, and sometimes if you have an allergy to something like testosterone or estrogen, it works its way out. So we have answers to that. That's called expulsion. And we usually, we have two pharmacies we use and we flip to the other pharmacy for you next time so that you won't expulse them and so, that, that helps. So when they compound these pills, they, they take the ingredients, uh, uh, testosterone, mm -hmm. estrogen, whatever you're putting mm -hmm. in the pill, but they have to have a base. They have a to have a binding. That they use a binding agent. Actually, it's one of our pharmacies just has estrogen and testosterone and they just pack it. They, they pressure With pack no it. With no binders at all? No. They used to, but they don't have that. Okay. Our other, our second pharmacy has something ca call, called, not benzoin, but it's a, it's like benzoin. It's, it's like a, a little bit of an iodine. It keeps kind of, is a preservative, but it also keeps it sticky. Mm -hmm. And so that sometimes works for some people, but some people are allergic to it. Right. But generally, if they're, if they don't like, if their body doesn't like one of them, they work the same. One, they don't like one of them, we use the other and they're fine, so we don't right. get the expulsion. Right, and you find if, that out the first time you do yeah, it. Yeah, we find that out the first round. The other issue is some people don't follow our directions. <gasps> Shocking. <laughs> so you're not supposed to be in a pool or a, or a lake or submerged in water for three days, and they mm -hmm. go to the Lake of the Ozarks where there's E. coli everywhere, which is a terrible infection, and they get infected. Yeah. That's not from the procedure. They just have to follow the directions, mm -hmm. and they know that. Um, or if we ask them not to exercise for two days or three days so sweat doesn't go down, carry bacteria down into the little incision, the little incision then because right. that infects the pellet. So mm -hmm. that causes an infection. So most of the time if you follow the directions and you don't have a sensitivity to it, then basically you don't have these side effects. So well, those are the side effects of the insertion. Growth? Now the side effects for women of testosterone, any kind of testosterone is facial hair. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, not like that. Not, but pellets have basically they all they always create some facial hair, but some women more than others, and it it sometimes is is predictable by um, the level of hormone called DHT. Not always, because sometimes you have more receptors. You know, it's always about the hormone and how many receptors you have. Right. So like Italians, Greeks, Southern Europeans, and some Irish have a lot of receptors in their in their hair follicles, mm -hmm. and, or they have more hair follicles. So when they get DHT at the same level as somebody else who's blonde and Scandinavian, who doesn't get any hair growth, the Southern Europeans will get a lot more. Mm -hmm. So we use troubleshooting. We t I ask people if they've ever had facial hair, if they have, then I give them either spironolactone, which is an off-label use of a diuretic, but it works to prevent facial hair growth in women. Or I use a drug called finasteride, which is also called Propecia. It's for hair yeah. loss for both men and women. But we use it uh, such that at a lo very low dose, because it doesn't require as much to prevent facial hair. So we have both of those. And we have 
We also have pellets that have finasteride mixed in them. So we can go that way without giving you another prescription for a pill. Mm -hmm. So we can, we can use the combination. But facial hair growth is the biggest risk of testosterone therapy. There are other things that are temporary, like clitoral growth sometimes occurs, and that's, it goes down, it, it goes up, it goes down, and, and that's not something that's permanent. Um, sometimes people who have not had testosterone in a long time or estrogen have itching around their bottom, around mm -hmm. their vagina, because there's, there's been no blood flow there mm -hmm. because there's been no testosterone. So all and of a waking sudden, those tissues it's up. waking everything up. So like, it's not... Like if you cross your legs too long and it goes to sleep and you get those tingly right. sensations. Right. Yeah, yeah, when you uncross it, it tingles. Yeah. yeah that's, it's the same idea. So, so that's the biggest thing that we talk about to women who are starting their mm -hmm. testosterone. And it depends. I don't talk to people who are 50 starting their testosterone right after menopause. Right. I talk to, about that. I talk to people who are 70 starting it. Right. So for, I, I choose my conversations based on your risk factors and your age and, and what you need from what me. What you're interested in. Why would you be considering doing this? The, hopefully, this will have given you some information that will be useful. There are other questions that are frequently asked questions that are posted on the website. And when you go to the website to get your information uh, and, and forms and so on and, and your blood test orders, you can look at those questions. And then if there's something you want more information about, when you go in to see Kathy, be sure and ask her. Write it down so you can remember it. Thank yeah, you. and after you have the testosterone replacement, you'll be able to remember it better. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.